bring in Mark Chandler of Brown Brothers Harriman. Too much to talk about. Bring up what was dreaded first chart earlier. We've got it up here now, Mark. Lisbon, we do not like austerity. It's a two-year yield on Portugal. Have you ever seen anything like this, these spikes, these three and four deviation spikes? It is just incredible. Partly the Portuguese government, despite all these negotiations, they just collapsed last night, and they have to have elections on the eve of the EU summit, where they need to negotiate, possibly for a package that the market thinks could be as big as 70 to 80 billion euros. You're all wired up with Lina Komaleva over in London and all that. Who's the new Portuguese? Who's speaking for Portugal? Well, right now you have the prime minister, so he should be a very wise man named Socrates. Problem is his government was a minority government, did have a majority in parliament, it just collapsed yesterday. He's still the caretaker, but he doesn't have a mandate. They'll have to have elections, it's just not sure when. Just that, that simple. You wrote a brilliant essay today, it was just, just great, on the correlation of yields. I want to read this quote from Mark Chandler's note. We're going to get a little mathy here, folks, but it's logarithm March. When looking at bond yields already percentages, a bond yields a percentage, we think that conducting the correlation on percentage is misleading. And if you come over here, and we got about eight things going here, folks. This is the Wikipedia on natural logs because it's logarithm march here for all the surveillance <laughs> properties. And down here, some fancy formulas and a nice smooth curve. Help us here. Why don't we use the normal methodologies you use when we look at these yield gyrations in Europe? Yeah, partly when you're looking at the correlations, it's really a highly quantifiable kind of stuff, high math. But essentially, if you're looking at a percentage change of percentages, it tends to be misleading because of how a small move could be a large percent. Right. And so what we want to do then is when we look at bond yields, we're just taking the absolute bond yield of Portugal and comparing it six. to six and comparing it to Spain. Cause, Four. Because the key issue is whether what's happening in uh, Greece, Ireland, and now Portugal is going to spill over to Spain. And Spain is important because Spain is bigger than Ireland, Greece, and Portugal put together. And so the hope is that the Europeans put a firewall and say what happens to Portugal, Greece, and Ireland won't happen to Spain. The measurement of this that the media uses, and for that matter, the pros use, which, given that you're not going to log mathematics and you're looking at the absolute values of the yields, a more arithmetic approach, do you look at credit default swap spreads or do you look at the traditional spreads to Germany? Right. I'm looking at just the, uh, the, the, what I'm trying to do in this piece was really look at if Spain is going to be the next one, is the next problem child. And I'm saying that what it looks like is the market so far is saying no, right. that the problems could be contained to Portugal, uh, Greece, and Ireland. But it's not clear, and that's the other point from these kind of charts, is that the correlation changes over time. So what we thought was the case, say, two months ago, you know, when uh, Ireland got their package, there was a, highly correlation, a high correlation, almost 80% yeah. right. of the time, Portugal and Spain went in the same direction. That correlation is broken down to less than half of that now. Why? I think partly because the market feels confident that uh, Spain's problems are being solved. By the by, IMF. Uh, but not by the IMF, not by Spain's own doings right now, okay. which is uh, they think that the Spain is addressing its uh, banking problem. It's a question whether it really has, but the market's giving it the benefit of the doubt. I personally am skeptical, but I think that we need a trigger for this, and we might not get that trigger until we get the stress tests from the European banks. That's going to be late in Q2. Foreign exchange reserves for Portugal. Look at that. I was stunned by this chart. It's like I thought it was a mistake when I put it up. Here's Portugal. Uh, too much information, folks. And it's foreign exchange reserves for Portugal, less than 2% of Europe GDP. It's a modest decline in reserves over six years. I mean, essentially, Portugal's bankrupt. Is that a amateur way of saying uh, it? Well, I wouldn't say quite yet bankrupt, because a lot, a lot of people would say that Portugal, how can Portugal be bankrupt? And their debt to GDP, the accumulation of past deficits, is lower than do it is in Germany. Vintage, do you drink <laughs> vintage or do you drink non-vintage <laughs> port? Let's start yes, there. Exactly, huh? No, I think that uh, Portugal is, is, is it's in trouble. Uh, I'm not sure if it's reached a point yet where we'd say it's bankrupt. I okay, think what bankruptcy fair. means it's got to restructure its debt. And so far, uh, the Europeans say restructuring the debt, we're going to kick down the road till after 2013. Can the ECB and the other institutions, can they move the proverbial can down the road? Or is this weekend in Germany with the votes and on into the end of March and then into April? Is the can now now? 
or is it really going to continue to be shoved down the road? I think that's exactly the tension between the markets who say we need to have closure on the situation now, which means we need restructuring sooner, and the Europeans who say that we're not ready for it because it could trigger, because we talk about a bailout for Portugal or a bailout for Ireland, but those countries aren't being bailed out. Their debt levels are higher than before. Who's being bailed out are the people who own the Portuguese bonds or the Greek bonds or the Irish bonds, and that's going to be a lot of German, French banks. Chart four. Let's switch gears. We're going to come back with Gerard Lyons and Mark Chandler as well. Let's go to Asia, where meanwhile, it's almost like meanwhile, back at the ranch, there's the Asian crisis. This is Asian DXY. Does not include Japan. Down we go. Crisis over there on the right side. And now we've nicely moved out to new highs during all of this foolishness with strong euro, 142. Do you, are you, do you have a short euro call right now? No. Uh, well, actually, I'm thinking that the euro is still making, going to make new highs. We probably have to go beyond those November highs that we saw uh, right before we had QE2. But I think that we're at the tail end. We, remember, we're coming up from, let's say, the low 130s, the high 120s. Right. And so I'm thinking that uh, maybe go up to 145, maybe it's 146, 147, Good. that kind of area. But what we're doing it now is buying the rumor on an ECB rate hike, and right. we're going to sell the fact. When it materializes. Right. But, but, but the bottom line here is Asia just continues to move on with currency yeah. advancement against the dollar. Yeah, I think as this chart shows, in really 97 and 98, the financial crisis caused a massive devaluation in East Asia. That created large trade surpluses for them. And now those currencies are slowly climbing back to where they were mm -hmm. in 97, 98. It's not like they're at higher levels than 97, 98. They're just mm -hmm. climbing back to where they were over 10 years ago. What's the number one dangerous myth in your book? Uh, probably the most dangerous myth would be that the U.S. power is really waning in the world. That the U.S., uh, that the role of the dollar is changing. And I don't really see that. I see the uh, role of dollar in reserves, the fact that we're still having oil prices denominated in dollars, most of the grains, foodstuffs, mm -hmm. precious metals, all about dollars. And even now, the Europeans can't solve a problem in their backyard called Libya. And so who's taking care of the heavy lifting for, the, uh, for taking out Libya's uh, uh, anti-aircraft uh, anti weaponry? U.S. forces. We don't want to get involved. Right. They're bringing us uh, getting involved. Uh, we're back with Mark Chandler, Brown Brothers Herald. And joining us from London, this historic day, the collapse of the Portuguese government, Gerard Lyons of the Standard Charter Bank. Uh, Dr. Lyons, you say it is a time to differentiate. What do you mean by that? Well, in terms of the time to differentiate, it's time to differentiate, particularly in Middle East and North Africa, between the countries there. The countries in North Africa very different to the ones in the Gulf. But in terms of Europe as well, I think one can relate it to the European story as well, but turn it around in the sense there's a need to differentiate across Europe because the economies are in very different shape. Those on the periphery look likely to have a recession for some time, while those at the core, Germany and Finland and uh, France, look in pretty good shape. And that's at the root cause of the problems we're now seeing here in Europe ahead of this summer, or whilst this summit's taking place in Brussels. The core country countries, Germany and Finland in particular, right. don't want to go on bailing out the periphery. When you look at the ability to differentiate, and I think of uh, the, the, I, the, what we've seen in the last number of hours, have you been surprised at how the equity markets and how the euro is held up, given the news flow of the last uh, day out of Lisbon? Um, no. Well, there's a perception you see here in Europe that Portugal, as important as it is, doesn't really matter that much in the big scheme of things. And I think the markets continue to look at the low level of policy rates and the continued amount of liquidity. That being said, I think the eurozone faces a deep crisis at some stage. It may be delayed this weekend, but it's going to come to the mm -hmm. fore at some stage. We not only have an economic difficulty, we have a potential political difficulty. Good economics is good politics, right. and the economics in the periphery of Europe is pretty bad. Mark, jump in here. We got, I got surveillance goosebumps, folks, over this chart. Let's bring it up here. I did this for Mark Chandler and Gerard Lyons. It's synthetic okay. Euro Swissy back 30 years. We took Deutsche Mark and inverted it and put in ice and it's a chart of Palooza, absolutely. Hildenbrand, the head of the Swiss National Bank, his three deviation headache off a cliff, strong Swissy. This is how odd this is when you look back that far.
Yeah, you know, I think the Swiss franc is at record highs against the euro, or just about. Uh, I think that uh, Gerard's right. Uh, I'm sorry, Gerald's right that the uh, European crisis and the Swiss franc is sort of acting like the old, the way the Deutschmark used to act as the yeah. sa safe haven within Europe. Uh, when there's problems, the people buy the Swiss franc. They tried intervening, and it, it failed. 22 billion. 22 billion later, and it, it failed. And uh, so people feel more comfortable that the Swiss franc is, has sort of like uh, no resistance from officials at uh, no from the uh, central bank now no resistance where is the institutional solution going to come Gerard Lyons where does Europe's institutional strength come from is it still 1-800 triche um, well basically the problem is that the Germans want the um, periphery to start behaving like Germany which isn't going to happen and the Germans want the European Central Bank to start setting interest rates to suit the Germans and not to suit the Greeks. So the guys obviously running the ECB are pretty smart guys. I think Trichy has done a fundamentally great mm -hmm. job. But the root problem here is one size doesn't fit all. One size doesn't fit all in terms of interest rates. So therefore there's a problem. If interest right. rates stay low, inflationary pressures build in Germany and they have angst, if interest rates go up, then it really hits the periphery very hard. Well, Mark, yeah, yeah, I, I would just please. disagree a little bit. I think that what, I think that what, uh, what Gerard said, I think, is represents the uh, conventional European view that this problem is that Spain and uh, Portugal and Greece and Ireland are living beyond their means, and they don't have no place to talk about a banking crisis that the bailing out these countries is really avoiding as a banking crisis. This isn't about Portugal living beyond its means. As I mentioned, right. Portugal's debt to GDP is lower than Germany's. Ireland, even after this crisis, Irish. GDP per capita is higher than in Germany. Mm -hmm. The problem is not these countries. The problem is a financial crisis that Europe wants to basically take the private sector debt and make the go governments nationalize it, make the private debt into public debt. And that's the origins of the public sector crisis that they want to try to solve well, now. I'll bring up this quote from Mark and Gerard. I want you to comment on this. The Spanish firewall is intact. Despite the recent credit downgrade and concern, the Spanish banks will require more capital. Do you agree with that, Gerard, that Spain will be okay, that the contagion effect here can be stopped at Portugal? Um, no. Um, two down, two to go is how I see it. Um, Greece and Ireland are down. The Irish economy outside of finance and construction was pretty good. Trouble is those two sectors became too big. Portugal, I think, given the political problems, they just exacerbate the economic difficulty. I think Portugal and Spain need to get help. In Spain, youth unemployment is sky high. The skill set is poor. The economy is going to be weak. There's no easy way out. So it's not just a financial issue. There are big issues in terms of some parts of the European banking sector still, uh, but the core economies in Europe are improving. The periphery stays weak, so it becomes an economic issue that moves on to becoming a political issue, and if it stayed like that, then it could again become a financial yeah. issue for some of I these want, countries. I want to get one last question in here quick, and we'll show this chart on the way out. What's your single best trade right now? You're in the tactical area as well. Right. I think that for, for, I think for most investors taking a three-month view, I think it's Swedish krona is still the best currency. Partly, it's, it's tied to Europe, but it has it's diversified exports right. away from Europe. Krona away from, against what? Against the dollar, against the euro. I think that there's a room okay. for the Riksbank to continue to raise interest rates. Very good, Mark Chandler. Thank you so much. We're